So good evening, everyone. Welcome to the New Era Paranormal Podcast. This week we have JD and Irene back for a podcast interview with Brennan M- M- Musula. I'm- That's close enough. <laughs> it's Musulo, but you just call me Brandon. Yeah. Uh, paranormal writer Brennan is also a clinical therapist and parapsychologist from Northeast Ohio. Brennan has been a featured speaker at many different events, including paranormal conventions, and he got his degree for psychology from Edinburgh, Scotland. He used all of his experience in his writing projects. So, Brennan, how did you get started on your journey with paranormal research? Oh, um, gosh, the journey. Uh, I would probably say it started way back when I was a teenager. I just picked up books on parapsychology from the local library, uh, started reading them, got really interested in them. Uh, I was a big fan of Ghostbusters. So, uh, you know, with Dr. Stance and um, Dr. Spangler. Bankman and Spangler, <laughs> that people don't realize this, but they all had PhDs in parapsychology. Uh, yeah. So I was like, I was like, what is that? And then once you start looking it up and the internet wasn't, when I was young, wasn't really around. So you had to go to the library. So you picked up, there might've had, I had a small library. You might've had like maybe 10 books on ghosts. So, you know, you just keep reading, 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 and you get interested in, are people actually studying ghosts? And and that's kind of what got me into it. I never had an experience uh, as a teenager or young adult. Didn't live in a haunted house. Uh, I don't have any psychic abilities. My family is not really um, like ghost people. You know, they're not talking about spirits or anything around the dinner table. Uh, so I just was really fascinated with psychology and then parapsychology, which for those of you who don't know, parapsychology is sort of the academic academic discipline of uh, researching or study paranormal phenomenon. So this includes uh, telepathy, ESP, um, near-death experiences, reincarnation, uh, psychokinesis, which is moving things with your mind. Uh, and then the survival hypothesis, which is ghosts, this idea that some part of our consciousness goes on after we die, um, whether that's a ghost or consciousness or spirit or whatever. But uh, parapsychology is a discipline of psychology. So you have clinical psychology, health psychology, parapsychology, uh, and there's academic institutions, mainly overseas. The UK has a couple programs. I think the United States just had one start a couple weeks ago. Uh, there's a PhD place in California that's now offering a PhD in parapsychology. So it's kind of coming to the States as well. Uh, most universities don't call it parapsychology. They call it like a consciousness studies or transpersonal psychology or um, some stuff like that. But it's basically parapsychology to some degree. University of Virginia has the, I think the, I yeah. remember, what's it called? Um, I think they do call it the parapsychology department. I thought it was like something with consciousness because they mainly study uh, reincarnation, but University of Virginia has a whole department on it. So, but that's what got me interested. I don't have a fun story. I always, I always feel bad. My origins are just a guy reading a book. <laughs> a lot of, <laughs> Hey, a lot of things originated from a guy reading a book or a person reading a book and then later yeah. on developing into something bigger. So <laughs> yeah, that's right. Just because you didn't see a ghost, we're not going to get mad at you. You know, there's people out there that don't have paranormal experiences. And, you know, I think we all want one, right? Uh, You know, we want to step outside the mundane, you know, the nine to five job. I wake up in the morning, I shower, get in my car, drive to work. I'll be there for eight hours. I come home, I eat, I work out. You know what I'm saying? We all want to be able to step out that mundane and have these enchanting, awe-inducing experiences. Uh, and we're kind of get jealous sometimes when other people have so many of them. And then I'm sitting there like, oh, God, I don't have what they have. There's a little bit of jealousy involved in that, isn't there? <laughs> uh, I wouldn't know. I've had experiences, so I can't. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I got to tell you, before, before I was, you know, I'm, you know, I can't say that, no. Because I've, I've always had something, you know, considering my background. But um, I get it. You want to – there's a lot of people – you want – like even now with people who do have have had paranormal experiences they want more because they want to believe that there's something greater out there something fantastical something more than this mundane you know machine that we run in every day so why not you know i get that totally yeah we're we're all searching for something uh you know i think religion 
in the past religion was part of that, but we and now that um, it's a lot, a lot of people are moving away from organized spirituality, uh, their own people, whether it's new age. Yeah, like was your audio just going in and out? Yeah, it sounded like there was. No your audio went out a little bit, but I heard I heard religion and new age with the new age movement and things like that. Well, can you hear me okay now? Yeah. Yeah, okay. much better. I don't know. Maybe the record came in or out. So just <laughs> just raise your hand if it goes out, and I'll just unplug <laughs> it. You know. Um, but uh, yeah, I was gonna say most people are moving away from organized religion into more of a spirituality type thing. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Seeing that a lot. Also with experiences, it took me a long time to get some rather large experiences. So Yeah. Definitely understand that. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean everybody wants, you know, you have all the little things like oh the lights are flickering or these little and you know, things are happening. The electricity's fine, but you can't explain it. And then but it takes a lot to get that big, you know full body apparition or a door opening and closing. It can't be explained. Things like that. Like those, yeah, those yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's interesting, you know, your book talks about, so your book is called, uh, the ghost studies. Oh, yay. Yeah. Right? There it is. So it talks about a lot of things on, okay, people will have paranormal experiences. Why are people possibly having paranormal experiences? Why are they having less? Some having lesser, some having greater paranormal experiences. Also, the psychological side of it. So, is it really a paranormal experience? Experience, or is it something biological going on? So, or even the bioenergetic um, theory that you talk about too in, in your book. I can't. The, well, I think it was L field, but I guess we'll get to that. But you talk about all kinds of different possibilities that lead to paranormal experiences, or what we think are paranormal experiences. I think you have another term for it. You call it was it ghostly encounters, or yeah, yeah. We I, it's kind of a catch-all. Um, sometimes in the literature they call it like haunt type phenomenon, because when you say ghostly, people think of like um, apparitions. But yeah, we the all lady know in the white dress flowing by. Yeah, you know most ghostly encounters are are sense of a presence, uh, sudden change in temperature, uh, acute emotional changes, light disturbances, like you said, flickering. Um, so ghosts actually seeing a full full apparition is kind of very rare, mo mostly. So we use the term like ghostly encounters or haunt type phenomenon just to be more inclusive of everything that's going on for sure. That's that's the big difference. OK, makes a lot of sense. So where did you focus most of your ghostly encounters on with your book? Uh, with the book, uh, we kind of focused a little bit more on, I, I, have you ever heard of crisis apparitions? Uh, I can explain them a little bit. Yeah, why don't you uh, explain it for us? Yeah. Okay. So crisis apparitions are great. Um, so this is an example would be, you know, I'm laying in bed at one o'clock in the morning and an apparition of my aunt appears in front of me and she says, I love you. Uh, goodbye. And then I end up falling back asleep somehow, and then I wake up tomorrow or the next morning, and I get a call from a family member saying my aunt died at 1 a.m. last night. And this coincides with the same time that she appeared in front of me and gave me this message, right? So a crisis apparition is when you have, uh, when you see an apparition or have some type of ghostly encounter, right at the moment another person is going through a crisis. So in this case, um, for this example, my aunt was uh, passing away. So obviously when someone's passing away, they're going through a lot of internal crisis, psychological crisis, probably uh, some physical stuff happening. Because anytime we're in a crisis, like uh, in a car accident or something like that, uh, our body is doing all kinds of different things. But anyway, when a person's in a crisis uh, and like dying, uh, all these changes happen internally and then they somehow communicate to a person thousands of miles away what's going on through an apparition. So in the book, we look at a lot of crisis apparitions. And I think these are great. Uh, these aren't focused a lot on TV shows uh, for a lot of good reasons, because 
it, it, you know, TV shows kind of focus on a location, right? A haunting is in a little, like a house or a building or something. Um, but but these are great evidence as far as uh, survival of consciousness, uh, because it really shows uh, if I've never had a ghostly encounter in my whole life and I'm 45 years old, um, it's weird that I would have one at the same exact moment that my aunt passed away and it's seeing my aunt. So like statistically, the coincidence of that happening, the probability of that happening are astronomical and it moves away from being like a correlation to more like a causation, like one caused the other rather than they coincided or it's a coincidence. So crisis apparitions are great in that category. Um, so I always feel like whenever I do talks or do any of this, I, I kind of encourage people to look into crisis apparitions. I think it's a one of the most, I don't know, the coolest phenomenon when it comes to paranormal stuff. Uh, and when I give yeah. these stories and I describe it, uh, at least when I do some talks around town, people will often come up to me afterwards and go, yeah, that happened to me. Um, I didn't know there was a name to it. Um, but it's basically like telepathy or entanglement, communication at a distance during a time of crisis. I think um, you even bring up spon uh, spontaneous uh, apparitional trace theory. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah that <laughs> such a long i can't believe yeah. i remember that <laughs> yeah 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 so in the book i go over uh kind of the ingredients necessary for what possibly could happen in a crisis apparition um and sort of this idea that maybe elements are left behind or stored in the collective consciousness uh, and people are able to pull that out through locations so the book is a is a pretty deep dive into um, a lot of hypotheses or we can there it's more hypotheses than theories obviously uh, but uh, theories seems to be something that grabs people's attention uh, but and then I give some research or background about why this could be happening or um, you know some some research saying maybe this is happening and so it's a deep dive into all that and I always encourage people to just think outside the box so you know, seeing a ghost doesn't necessarily mean someone discarnate entity or spirit is hanging around in your apartment or house. It could be a numerous other reasons for it, too. Uh, you talk about residual energy or stone tape theory, uh, uh, like uh, psi or telepathy or projecting stuff into the environment. There's numerous other ways to look at it. So I think the ghost stuff has been covered pretty much in every book and TV show out there. So sometimes it's nice to look, read something that says, hey, well, maybe something else is going on. Because ghostly yeah. encounters are pretty complex. There's a lot happening from sensory to perceptions to internal energies and elect. Yeah, it, there's so much going on. It's tough to say it's just one thing. Yeah. Well, what I thought was pretty cool is what you just talked about, the, um, the uh, crisis... Uh, crisis haunting right or crisis uh, experience mm -hmm. that um what when and you brought up residual hauntings and the locations are what are focused on the most you know what i thought was pretty cool that you brought up in, in your book was that people think the location is the only place that can be haunted you brought up the theory that yes but if we send out some a telepathic message in that way it's not just the, the traumatic experience in the location, it's the traumatic message that gets sent out. That's what you're talking about with the aunt on the other side of the, the her passing away, um, if you see your aunt at the end of your bed, which I thought was pretty cool. And the yeah. fact that the haunting is not just in that location, it could be somewhere else. Yeah, I think the common theme, and I think pop culture has told us this, that a haunted house means there's some sort of tragedy that's happened there, right? There's a death or unfinished business or arguments or some intense something happened in that place. And it's sort of the vessel to hold that energy, right? Um, so uh, I'll give an example of the aunt. So the aunt, my aunt passes away at her house and um, I don't know, uh, let's say she lives in Virginia, right? So my aunt passes away at her house in Virginia but I see the apparition in my house in Ohio, right? So I see this apparition in my bedroom of a floating person saying, I love you. Now let's fast forward 20 years. I move out of the house and new people move into the house that I'm living in, in Ohio. Um, 
they're in the bedroom and they start getting feeling a sense of presence and they see a floating woman and she says i love you right so they don't know what to do so they see a ghost right so they call in like a paranormal investigation team maybe they get an evp saying i love you uh, maybe the psychic sees a ghost of a, a woman who um, uh, just passed away, uh, something like that. Um, so then you have this sort of collateral information about what's going on. But my aunt didn't die in my house. There wasn't a tragedy in my house. They're picking up on sort of the residual communication between uh, my aunt and myself when she passed away. So you could have a house that has no tragedy in it. Um, no uh, deaths, nothing that could have some sort of um, paranormal-ish activity to it. Um, and in the book, I go over a, a lot of uh, information about sort of collective unconscious and how the environment or the earth that we live in may have the capacity to sort of hold on to the thoughts and memories of everyone who's ever lived. And that's not my hypothesis or theory. That's from a uh, Michael Persinger, who's a, uh, I think he was a neurologist out of Canada. Um, and just recently, there was another article published in a, a collection of essays about the best evidence survival of the best evidence for survival of consciousness by the Bigelow Institute. And one of the uh, PhD uh, researchers mentions that uh, hypothesis as well of uh, the environment being able to hold on to all this sort of information from past memories. If anyone's interested, there's a YouTube video called No More Secrets by Michael Persinger. It just kind of goes over how the environment can hold on to this information. Was he also the one that developed the God helmet? Or Yeah, yeah. Persinger is, if, if you've ever used an EMF meter, if, if you're a ghost hunter listening to this, you owe it to uh, Dr. Michael Persinger. Uh, so I think in the late, it might have been the 80s, uh, he's the one that developed the God helmet. And it was basically like a motorcycle helmet that shot EMFs into people's brains. And what they found out was when they shot EMFs in certain people's brains, they would have a sense of presence. Uh, some people would actually see apparitions, things like that. So uh, what they did was um, they kind of figured out uh, maybe there was a certain magnetic frequency that was associated with it. And then what they did was they took it out into the public so they actually took these EMF meters and did readings in people's homes. So um, there was one example of a, a young woman who saw a ghost by her bed every night. Um, and what they found was when they did the readings, they, she had a clock next to her bed. And this clock was emanating what they call um, complex fluctuating EMFs, which basically means just like this. Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. Uh, between 10 and 40 milligauss, which is kind of low when you think about it. But anyway, uh, once they removed the clock, she stopped seeing ghosts. So that was sort of the basis of EMFs being correlated with uh, ghostly encounters um, and bringing EMF meters into the field and doing that type of thing. Uh, and and it's, it's morphed since then, obviously. So uh, you can use an EMF one in the hands of whoever, an EMF meter could be used to rule out electromagnetic fields causing brain farts, if you want to think about it like that. Yeah. Or it could be used in some people's hands to detect the presence of a ghost. So it just depends on who's holding the EMF as far as their perception of what's going on. But Persinger was sort of the father of all that stuff. But people don't know he did research. Uh, he passed away, I think. Um, I, don't know, I can't remember when, maybe 2015, but he has a lot of articles on entanglement and telepathy and all kinds of great stuff, which I mentioned in the book. So, Brandon, as far as a uh, crisis spirits, what do you, what is your thought on uh, like hitchhikers, that type of residual emotionally charged spirit? A hitchhiker? Is that what you said? Yeah. Can you explain that to me a little bit? Like, like a physical ghost on a highway? Or is that a, a term I don't know of? Uh, essentially, uh, somebody that died in a car crash, they get in the car with a, a oh, live okay. person to follow them to some destination, but they don't make it the, all the way. Yeah, I've, I've, um, that one has been a common theme. I've heard that one quite a bit. 
Um, there's a local, I did, I wrote a story on a local one here in Medina, Ohio, uh, the ghostly hitchhiker of I-71. And he would get in the, uh, he would be on the side of the roads like hitchhiking and people would pick him up. But that, that what's interesting about that story is the, the ghostly hitchhiker goes all the way back to, I, I think, like the Bible. There was a story in the Bible where they picked somebody up. I can't remember the names off the top of my head. Um, and then the, the person they picked up ended up being, uh, I think, an angel that just disappeared in front of the person who picked them up. So that story is almost as old as the age, uh, a very old tale. Um, so I don't know what to make of that. You know, I, I think I'm always I always tell people be hesitant of somebody who has an answer to every question when it comes to ghostly stuff, because that's a red flag that they just sort of are making it up. Uh, it's OK to say, I don't know. Like a lot of my thoughts and my hypotheses in the book have to do with uh, crisis apparitions and um, um, sort of like residual type stuff. I can't, the, my thoughts and theories and hypotheses don't cover like intelligent hauntings where ghosts communicate with you or give you information like, hey, my will is under the desk and or hidden behind a wall. My thoughts and stuff, does my theories don't really deal into that. And I, I don't know how to explain those types of things other than maybe it's a discarnate entity or collective consciousness, you know, something getting in there. So I don't know the answer to the ghostly hitchhiker one. Well, I've seen, at, I've seen at monasteries uh, throughout my life, and I've, I've, I've heard those stories from people who work, in, who are, who stay or are present in the monasteries that have um, had experienced saintly experiences. So they say the saint was in the car with them. So yeah, they, they, they have these experiences from, from biblical times and on. It's still, it's still happening. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's super it's hard to say that something like that can't be possible when, there's record of it throughout history. What's is it can't be mass hallucination. They're, oh, they're, gosh, they exist yeah. at different times, right? It's it's pretty yeah. interesting. Yeah, I, 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 a lot of these stories are, this, are, are, I feel like are like that. You know, do you discount everyone's story? Uh, no, I mean, the collective mass amounts of subjective experiences are hard to discount. Um, so. Uh, I would never say someone never had a ghostly encounter. I'm not in the business of debunking. Uh, it's not my specialty. Uh, I, that there's people out there who are better at it and um, sort of have the power to not feel <laughs> that could just destroy somebody's enchanting, awe-inducing experience <laughs> yes. at will. Um, I, I always tell people you need to be Enchantment or awe, which now awe is this idea of stepping outside the norm. We talked about this a little earlier, um, but we need that as humans. It's actually necessary for us to kind of live in a way. We, we being just drowned in disenchantment and mundane uh, impacts us emotionally and psychologically. Um, so seeking that out is actually healthy. Uh, I, I know you know, when, when we're in awe or enchanted of something, we're actually nicer people. We're more connected to the earth. We're not as focused on money and greed and crushing the competition. We actually feel more connected to people when we have an awe-inducing experience, like walking into a cathedral and being just overwhelmed with the architecture uh, or, you know, the birth of a child or these amazing awe-inducing experiences that just make us like step outside of ourselves. We're kinder. We're more likely to connect to others. We're more social. Um, we're just better humans when we're able to do that. So to take that away from somebody is almost like, to, so to me, it's a little cruel. Um, now, you know, you can't go too far with it. If you're seeing ghosts every day, all day, and it becomes, you know, who you are, and that's how you identify with, maybe there's you may have to relook at your life, but one or two ghostly encounters uh, a month or a lifetime is not a bad thing. Yeah. Also, you know, debunking isn't all that bad when there's when there's fear. So mm -hmm. if somebody is very afraid and you come in and you debunk, you you give them the breath of fresh air. Like they're 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 happier. They're okay. They feel safer. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I agree with you on the on. It, it, it causes a disillusionment. It, 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 it changes a person. You know, I would rather have like happier people than, than embittered people around me for sure. 
it, yeah, yeah, and and I think that's important too. You're right. It's there's certain situations where if you can't ease somebody's distress by saying, "Hey, I think it's just this," like the clock. He took away the clock, everything went away, and this this girl was able to sleep better at night, and her life was so much better. So th there's a place for these types of things. But mm -hmm. if somebody has a random encounter six years ago, and you know they moved out of the house, and there's no way to really debunk it, um, and they get a lot from it squashing it or saying ghosts don't exist it's not maybe not helpful for that person because i no. think research says people who have ghostly experiences are, are kind of overall mental health wise better they're just um, um you know it gives them that sense of maybe there is something more to life increases yeah. their spirituality um you know all these things that it can do for a person but then on the other side if they're very fearful and there's ghosts jumping on them at night then that's not going to make their well-being a lot better. It's going to make it a little bit more challenging to get through the day for sure. And that's understandable, 100%. So um, I also think, you know, you, you, you mentioned it, you know, people don't, well, you, you talk about wanting not to disillusion somebody or, or things like that, but also that you have the, the deniers that it, this doesn't exist. You know, I'm, I'm good for a skeptic. Everybody should be skeptical, I believe, like in anything when we when we handle paranormal experiences. But but right now, I feel like we have the most of what we're kind of grouped into in the in the world. Predominantly, not everybody are like the deniers and the full on believers. But the in the middle, like, OK, why do you believe? Why do you completely deny? So like to find out the why and to understand is what's kind of missing in this what we need more of in terms of investigation and study and research, which is why I enjoy what, what you're doing and trying to look at other possibilities and other, other types of um, experiences that could, you know, be explained in terms of paranormal experiences or ghostly encounters. Yeah. Yeah. What you're talking about is what they call absolute thinking. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and that's either you're right or you're wrong. It's good or it's evil black or it's white right and when we think that way now politics is a great example if i'm if i'm all the way to the right everything they say and do i gotta follow right if i'm absolutely all the way to the left it's the same way but you lose a little bit of independence and you just become sort of a follower and finding proof to um, validate your beliefs right so skeptics are always going to find proof to validate their beliefs believers are always going to find proof to validate their beliefs as well so you lose some of that subject you lose a lot of open-mindedness and you discount a lot of good research if you go on opposite sides of that so staying in the middle and going a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right or to the belief or to the skeptical is okay you know you don't have to just say everything is this or everything is that uh, so i do agree with you Irene. i think that's a good place to be but a lot of times people, you know, it's like you can't flip flop. You can't do this. You can't do that. You have to pick a side. You have to be a believer or non-believer. And that's obviously not true. Uh, you can do whatever the heck you want to do. Uh, I can say, you know, at one point, this probably wasn't a ghostly encounter. It was this. And then another day I can say, I think this was a ghostly encounter. It's okay to do that. Um, flip changing your mind or changing your mind based on new information is actually a sign of, um, you know, good cognitive uh, decision-making skills, right? <laughs> right. With new information comes new ideas, and that can sometimes change your old ideas or perceptions on things, uh, exactly. whether that's politics or ghosts or relationships, uh, yeah. all that stuff. Exactly, I agree. So, Brandon, it sounded like you were doing in uh, at location research also, at least including the Instill House. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your, yeah. Upcoming, your upcoming work. Yeah, I was doing some. Um, I'm in the process of writing a book with some people right now, um, and we stayed a couple nights at the Hinsdale House. And what we did was we did a. Um, uh, a, a pretty intense investigation of the location, like field work type stuff. So data loggers, uh, infrasound, 
We even had like an EEG uh, neurofeedback thing around the head so they can look at the structures and get some readings on that. Um, and then we gave a questionnaire to 262 people who visited the Hinsdale house to look at sort of what their emotions were when they went through it, um, what types of experiences they had as, as well as the number of experiences they had. Uh, and we looked at sort of um, uh, biological differences between people. So are some people more hardwired to see ghosts? Uh, and so we went in there, we did all this uh, information and right now we've got it all back and we've been sort of piling through it to see if we can find some, just get a better idea of why certain locations are haunted, right? So some places are haunted, some places are not. Is there anything different about the location that makes it haunted as opposed to one that's not? Um, so you look at all the variables associated with it, and that could be electromagnetic fields, ions, um, um, uh, geomagnetic fields, uh, infrasound, uh, which is sound below the human hearing that can impact you. Um, uh, and we looked at all these environmental stuff, but we also wanted to look at the individual too. So what makes this person different as opposed to another person? Why is this person having all these experiences and this person not? So, um, you know, we looked at all that and then we're in the process now of kind of writing the conclusion and going over all the data, but the Hinsdale house, for those of you who haven't been there, there's a lot of experiences that happen. We got, um, close to, I think 2000 ghostly encounters reported to us, uh, which is a lot, you know, uh, so it's a lot of data to go through, <laughs> you know, I wasn't expecting, uh, the average person to have like 10 or 12 experiences who went through there. Um, I was expecting maybe one or two from people. Uh, so, and, and we, that, that's actually on the low end because we could have, the, the questionnaire we gave them, we asked, did, like, uh, if you saw a ghost, did you see uh, an apparition? Yes or no? We didn't put, did you see an apparition? Yes, no, how many? So it's probably more than that. So it may be three times as much as we actually gathered. So uh, these are things you don't think about when you're making the survey, unfortunately. But I think this is something where, you know, when ghost hunters talk about, um, you know, we've, we've all seen the stuff on TV. It's getting kind of boring now. It's the same stuff. People walk in, they do their meeting, their readings. Uh, they walk around to each room. They ask questions to the spirits. They do an Estestes method. They, you know what I'm saying? It becomes the same thing over and over again. And you're not really sure. collecting data you're not collecting like hard objective data more or less because you're not tracking the EMFs that you're getting like in a statistical program. You're not doing statistical analysis on it. You're not doing questionnaires on it. So what you do is you go in, you do that and you do all this hard work and you go through all these EVPs and things like that. And then it just disappears. It's gone. Uh, and you move on to the next one. Whereas if we collect the data and we put it all into an Excel sheet, now we have hundreds and thousands and, um, of all this data of all these haunted locations when if you combine it with all the paranormal research groups all over the world then you have all this data that you know academics and science and could take this and calculate things and get some information from rather than just i'm going to look at video and evps for six hours <laughs> on a sunday and then move and then have a team meeting and then it disappears the next week you did all that work put it in an excel sheet you know, collaborate, do all this stuff. I think there's sometimes a difference of not a lot of collaboration in, in with paranormal teams that uh, unfortunately is, I don't know, I don't think that's good for the field in general. That was my long-winded answer to that question, JD. I'm sorry, I went off on a, a super second tangent on that. Uh, but yeah, we are studying the Hinsdale House and uh, I know you've been there. Did you have an experience there, JD? Uh, just a lot of technology and equipment oriented activity. Okay, so like I've been meters going some off and... well, Yeah, I, I I always I would say about the craziest thing is that uh, I'm probably having internet issues. No, I heard you. What was the craziest thing? Yeah, you left us high and dry there. <laughs> Oh, I don't think he can hear us. He, he might be us. having a delay. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, it was. It's a delay or not a good connection. Oh. Yeah, that's so for JD, he's had experiences there. I've never been. I have participated in a live a live feed where I've, you know, seen things through the live feed, but I've never had like personal experience there. Are you back, JD? Can you hear us? I well, he can hear you, yeah. Oh, there you go. Okay, so what was the craziest thing? Uh, one of my investigators showed up with a dream, I believe, beforehand of the uh, name of Monica, I believe. Then we did a Ouija board session in the basement, got that same name through the Ouija board, and then Alex actually heard it in his ear, whispered in his ear at the Hensdale house. So it was three, uh, three accounts of the same name. That's pretty oh, really? interesting. Yeah, that actually I've had that happen on a, a residential investigation on th on different through different mod modalities, the same information coming through, which is pretty cool when that happens yeah. because you get repetition and you get repetition in, in different types of testing. Yeah. Yeah, it's great stuff. I mean, I, something about Hinsdale. I, I don't know what it is. Um, people become obsessed with it too. There's a lot of people that go back. I don't want to say hundreds of times, but multiple times they go up there, almost like addicted to this place. Um, you know, like the Conjuring House too. People go back over and over again. Oh, really? Know? Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I see. Certain haunted locations are like that. It's almost like this um, obsession that people have. Um, you know, almost like a like a drug or yeah, like a like high a, that there's yeah. <laughs> have that experience. Yeah. So I, I have never really thought about that before. Cause you know, most people run from haunted locations, correct? <laughs> right. It's like my most wife, does, people. <laughs> yeah. Not all. my wife doesn't want to go to the conjuring house and I, I don't blame her. And, uh, you know, but there's a certain population out there that runs to the fire rather than away from the fire. Um, yeah. and then it becomes almost, fire becomes an obsession to him or ghost becomes an obsession to him. So it's a, it's an interesting psychological phenomenon that happens. So that's why I thought like getting questionnaires from people would give us a better understanding of, you know, who's going to the Hinsdale house. Number one, number two, how, what kind of experiences that are having. And number three, is there any way we can figure out why they're having so many of these experiences? And there's a lot of research out there that kind of has been able to find out certain personality variables among people who have numerous ghostly encounters, uh, and sort of neurobiological things as well. So there are some answers to it. Uh, answers is sort of maybe not the best word. There are some suggestions on why some people have more experiences than others, but it's so early and it's hard to prove uh, ghostly um, why that is. But I think there's, there's avenues to go down for sure. Do you find a certain demographic, um, male versus female, or age, or something matters in terms of paranormal experiences? Well, females definitely have way more ghostly encounters than males, uh, at least according to surveys and research. Uh, it seems to be way more prominent in females. Do you think it's the estrogen level or testosterone <laughs> level, or do you think it's something different? Uh, it, you know, uh, I think it has a lot to do with how we are neurobiologically so how what we're born with if you want to think about it like that uh in the book i talk a lot about a hypersensitivity to the environmental stimuli that go around sometimes it's called environmental sensitivity or transliminality or uh, hyper uh, sensitivity processing um, or um, thin boundary but basically what it means is there's a subset of the population that just seems to be better at picking up things in the environment Right. Has nothing to do with psychic sensitivity, has nothing to do with uh, that type of stuff. Like like your um, who's a popular psychic? Uh, Cindy Kaza. Cindy Kaza or uh, who's the guy with the scarf? The oh, um, Chip Coffee. <laughs> Thank you. Chip, Chip Coffee and uh, uh, all those people. It's not has, doesn't have to do with that. It more has to do with this idea of just being connected to the environment. So if I walk into a room. We all experience the world differently. If all three of us walk into the same room and we sit under fluorescent lights, 
we sit on a, a chair that has just been wiped down with bleach and I'm sitting next to a guy who has overdosed on old spice. Um, I'm perfectly fine, but Irene might go in there, get, might get nosh or headaches from the fluorescent lights. She might get nauseous from the old spice and she might get a rash from the bleach wipes on the chair. Right. Yeah. So we're in the same environment. We're experiencing the same things, but we're reacting to these environmental things differently than others. These people who are environmentally sensitive have like migraines, chemical sensitivity. Um, they also have a lot of fibromyalgia. Uh, they also have uh, sort of other, some other uh, personality variables or psych uh, psychological dynamics. These people tend to have way more ghostly encounters because if ghosts happen in the environment or things happen in the environment, obviously people who have a higher sensitivity to pick up things in the environment are more likely to pick them up. Um, there was a Netflix documentary, uh, I think during COVID, like 2020, of this group of people who were so sensitive to electromagnetic fields that they couldn't even live in general population because uh, oh, it was wow. just messing with their heads. So they would move out to the desert. There's some city somewhere in the United States that can't have electromagnetic fields because it has this super sensitive satellite. So they're banned. Um, so these people live out there uh, because they can't, they can't carry cell phones. They can't have computers because it just messes with them physically so they get ill from them uh, so this sort of group of people is really really sensitive or hypersensitive to electromagnetic fields uh, so these types of sensitivities to the environment these people have way more paranormal experiences uh, and they also people generally speaking more a lot of females have environmental sensitivity as opposed to males so I think it's 70 30 something like that yeah. um, so i guess it would make sense why go my females might have more ghost encounters too if you kind of look at that what about age do you think age does play play a role do you think do you think somebody who's older maybe has had more experiences in life and would kind of look at something from a different perspective as opposed to somebody young because perception is something also you can walk into a room and one person perceives the space in a completely different way as another person Exactly. So yeah. do you think the younger perspective versus an older perspective will influence paranormal experience? Yeah, you're right. Um, I don't know about age. I actually never really thought about that. Um, you know, I, I guess sometimes when we do these surveys, we ask the question, at least me personally, at least maybe for the Hensdale one, I don't think we even looked at that. Like this age play part in it. Because I, every time... I talk to people, they always talk about how children have more ghostly experiences mm -hmm. than adults. And they, they always ask kind of like, why? And I'm like, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I guess, let's say theoretically ghosts exist. Um, you know, maybe okay. the kids, the younger kids aren't overwhelmed with sort of that day to day. I got to pay the bill. I got to do this. I got to yeah. do that. They're more sort of focused on the here and now and the present. Right. Yeah. So they're just experiencing the world for what it is and they're not inside their head. Uh, so maybe that is better because I guess when you do like these side tests or ESP or telepathy, usually they don't want you like you're not going to do an ESP test or a side test in a in a club or a rave at 2 a.m. in the morning with the music <laughs> blaring. Right. right. Because it's just too distracting and overwhelming stimuli to focus. Um, so maybe kids they're not inside their heads and they're able to sort of focus and be more mindful or present or contemplative or whatever. Uh, maybe that opens them up. Um, but then again, kids have imaginary friends. And so there's all these things that are kind of correlated or mixed in with all this stuff. Also less societal influence. No yeah. expectations in that way too. Yeah, you're right. If, if um, a, you know, a 45 year old says they saw a ghost, you know, that may impact their relationship with their wife or their coworkers or right. whoever. But a kid can say that or a six year old could say that. Their friends will be like, Oh, okay, did you see Dora the Explorer? You know, it doesn't register, you don't get that uh, shunning or stigma associated with it. It's pretty interesting. Um, what about so there's something um, in the paranormal world and I, I think you I, I think you referenced it possibly in the book too. Um, PK manifestations, the psychokinetic manifestations. So for what do you, what are your thoughts on that type of, ex or the poltergeist experience, that type of experience? 
Yeah, yeah. so um, uh, 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 you, there's there's poltergeists, uh, which are sort of that noisy ghost, the ghost that sort of moves things around, throws the plates, uh, does that. We, we've seen the movies, right? The, they're, they're throwing stuff around. And then you have what's called uh, uh, RSPK, or recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis. And we talked about this briefly before. Psychokinesis is the ability to move things with your mind, sort of like the force. So RSPK, or recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, is basically uh, recurrent means happens uh, more than once. Spontaneous means you don't have control over it. It's not in your conscious control. And psychokinesis basically means uh, moving things. So the greatest example of RSPK in fictional writing is Carrie from Stephen King's novel, right? Yeah. So Carrie goes through all this mental anguish. She doesn't get any support from her mom. Uh, she's in a state of constant psychological distress and, as a teenager. And this manifests in a way that she moves things around. Her. There's stuff flying around. There's fire starting. There's doors closing. It's locking her friends in. So she's, in a way, impact the environment through her mind. So Carrie is an example of that wasn't a ghost that was hanging around Carrie and shutting the doors and spilling blood on people or whatever was happening. Um, that wasn't a ghost that was doing it. It was who? It was Carrie that was doing it, right? So that's sort of that example of psych, uh, psychokinesis. And you see that sometimes in the world that we're in right now. Uh, I just wrote a paper on uh, a very famous case out of Poland about a, uh, a young girl, uh, Joanna, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong, um, who was studied by numerous uh, specialists in Poland, from metallurgists to physicists to physicians to uh, chemical engineers. The, the, the best brains in all of Poland studied her and couldn't really figure out how she was moving stuff around and what was happening. Uh, there's a book called The Elusive Force, if you're ever interested in it. It goes over all this stuff. But basically, she was able to move things with her mind. Um, and I think that this is something we think doesn't happen. Uh, but who knows, right? Uh, it's hard to really study this stuff consistently because it's spontaneous. Don't know when it's going to happen, right? <laughs> so it's hard to put a person in a, a MRI machine and have it happen automatically. There seems to be a psychological component to it. They have to be it's under not, stress. It's not ethical to drive them to it either. So Yeah, exactly. So there's all these sort of variables when it comes to researching this. But what they found is you, you kind of work from the, the back end to the front end. So what they found is if there is sort of PK or poltergeist-like activity in households, if you give them counseling, and you decrease the psychological distress that they're under, under the phenomenon decrease, right? So that tells us it probably has something to do with internal stuff. Now, like if Carrie in the movie was able, was seeing a counselor or a psychologist, maybe all this stuff wouldn't have been flying around, right? So we sort of have a way to deal with it, but we don't know exactly what it is. Uh, and there's a lot of papers out there that, that basically uh, have provided counseling to people and they've gotten a little bit better. Um, so th that's their the researcher's perspective on it to some degree. But I think PK is a kind of a fascinating thing. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not, that's really not my expertise. I've never done any actual physical face-to-face -face research on people with PK subjects who are moving things around. Uh, I'm more of the ghost guy, if you want to think about it like that. Uh, but I've read a lot of accounts. And, um, you know, I've had a lot of people tell me a lot of PKs type stuff. That's pretty, for me, it's fascinating because we don't, we don't really know uh, what our brain is capable of. You know, there's only so much we know and we've studied that, that, that there's, there's, there's probably some bigger explanation we have no, no clue of yet. We won't know for another 20 years of scientific research. It's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And I yeah, can't wait till we can figure it out. <laughs> that's the thing. It's like you don't know until, like, all the technology we have right now doesn't seem to be able to detect the presence of a ghost. That's for sure. Like, your EMFs aren't detecting ghosts. They're not ghost meters, right? Um, no, it's detecting EMF fluctuations. Yeah. Exactly. So we, we're we're sort of handcuffed by the technology of the day. 
So there's a lot of things we just don't know about. I mean, consciousness, we, we, we know we're aware. We, we know we're all individuals to some degree, but we don't know where in the brain this happens. Uh, this has been a debate for as long as we've been able to debate it. This the mind-body <laughs> issue is, is where does consciousness come from? Uh, is it internal? Is it external? Uh, we don't know. And there's been no way to prove it, but we know we are conscious. Um, so there's no way to definitively provide answers for that, uh, but we know it's, it exists. So yeah. well, there's even uh, quantum physicists now trying to study the fact of where consciousness actually exists. I, I, I think there's, yeah, there's a lot of great minds working on this problem. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, they, they've, I don't know how far they've gotten <laughs> because I haven't really seen anything that says, hey, this is definitively what it is. Just but, theory, just some theories right now. Yeah, and, and that's all we have. You know, subjective mm -hmm. experiences are, are often discounted, um, but sometimes that's all we have to go by. And, you yeah. know, psychology is basically a whole discipline devoted to subjective experiences. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, <laughs> you know, uh, to some degree, medicine is based on subjective experiences too, right? Yeah. Um, you know, that, what, what's your pain from zero to 10? Uh, when you go to the, when you take a medicine, uh, so even in the FDA trials, uh, people give their reports, right? So this makes me sick or this makes me really anxious or this makes me have a headache. Uh, I can't prove you're anxious. Right. Uh, but, and don't forget the placebo effect. Yeah. Yeah. So every medication we take is... Uh, based on subjective reports for the people who tried it out, yeah. you know, if somebody says, hey, this blood pressure medication lowers my blood pressure, but it makes me super anxious and I have panic attacks all day, um, I could objectively see that your blood pressure went down. <laughs> yeah. But it, is it causing more problems? <laughs> I don't know. It's causing you to have panic attacks all day. Uh, so, you know, would that medication be helpful for the masses? Probably not, because you're going to have people whose blood pressure is okay, but you're going to have a lot of people with panic attacks and struggling throughout the day. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh, there's so many questions I still want to want to ask, but you're bringing up the fact of people having their own subjective experiences. So can you kind of maybe explain for, you know, people watching, you know, when we talk about hallucinations, schizophrenia, different types of people, like um, psychological um, issues that can cause people to see apparitions, to have certain types of experiences versus somebody who would just have a paranormal experience. That it's just, it's not schizophrenia, it's schizophrenia or hallucinations. Yeah, you know, ruling that out is, is not as easy as, uh, it takes a lot of sort of ex experience and knowledge to rule out the difference between the two. But typically people who have a diagnosis of schizophrenia don't just have one sort of ghostly experience. They have um, sort of long-standing hallucinations, auditory, uh, visual. Uh, there's also other symptoms that go with that. Sometimes disorganized behavior, uh, word salad. Um, there's numerous things that go on with schizophrenia. Uh, and I think for the most part, when you look at uh, mental health disorders like delusional disorders, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, manic episodes, usually it's to the point where it affects their ability to function. Right. So if I have one hallucination a year, um, that doesn't make me schizophrenic because it's not really impacting my ability to function. Um, if I'm having some schizophrenia symptoms that impact my ability to function and I need to be on medication um, or, or get treatment, there's a difference between that. Um, so, you know, it's not as easy as saying, well, this person has a ghostly experience, this person is schizophrenic. There's a lot of questions that go into it. There's a lot of history that's kind of based on it um so uh, you know when you it's like when ghost hunters go into people's homes <laughs> it could be challenging to determine the difference between someone who's having ghostly encounters versus someone who might have schizotypal personality disorder or schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder or certain types of mania uh, whether it's hypomania or uh, manic episodes there is a component of delusions and um to some degree, hallucinations involved in that. Uh, so it, it's not easy to do for the average person. Uh, even for myself, you can sometimes get muddled up in what is reality and what's not um, from a person. You know, someone could be paranoid and say, you know, someone's outside my house at, at night and 
you know, that is a reality that could happen. People have been stalked, right? <laughs> so how do you determine whether they're paranoid or if there is a person out there uh, right. trying to harm it? it, it, it I don't know. You, you have to really have a long conversations with these people, talk to their family members, talk to their whoever's, their physicians, and get a history of this has happened before and all these types of things. So it's it's not as easy as just giving you the answer there. Um, no, no, that's fine. But that but you are giving an answer. It, yeah. You can't just walk into a house and say, oh, that person seems like they've got something wrong with them and just leave it at that and say, I don't believe anything they have to say that you really have to do the do the work yeah. and get get more information. Being a, consult yeah. somebody who's a professional. Exactly. Being eccentric, eccentric is not a, a mental health diagnosis. Right. right. Yeah. Um, being psychic is not a mental health diagnosis. Feeling the ability to connect with people or get hunches or, um, you know, uh, feeling like you might be able to uh, see spirits or something like that is not a mental health diagnosis. Um, if it begins to impact your daily functioning, like at work and at home, then there's a conversation to have, right? Uh, and then there's a route to go down with that. But isolated events don't necessarily signify mental health. Um, but like I said, you're right. It's you got to have you got to get an expert in there if there is some concern, yeah. uh, or if somebody feels like they're seeing ghosts all the time, it's not a bad idea to go see somebody and have a conversation about it. Right. Uh, I know people are hesitant because they think they'll get admitted to a, a psych unit or something like that. Yeah. But it's about decreasing your distress. If if someone adamantly believes that a medication could be helpful, or you do have a diagnosis of schizophrenia, it may take away some of the distress you're having or the fear or give you a improved ability to function um, may take away some of your beliefs, but uh, that's, that's why it's such a complicated field because years ago, and you, you guys know this, like 15, 20 years ago, there were ghost hunters going in everybody's house, right? <laughs> it was happening all the time. There were videos, there was case reports. You don't see that as much nowadays, right? Yeah. Uh, now people are more going to these public places like the Hinsdale house or the conjuring house or whatever. They're not really going into people's homes because there's a bit of a challenge or a liability associated with that. Um, and it's dangerous too, for some people to just walk in their house. Cause you don't know what you're walking into for sure. Yeah, definitely. Do you think also that the people's education too, on what is paranormal versus what's not paranormal is actually slowing that down too. They now realize, oh, okay, you know, that noise that I hear, well, that's my furnace. When it kicks on, it makes this silly noise or my refrigerator ice machine, that's a big one, makes this weird yeah. noise, so. <laughs> yeah, critical thinking, you have to do it. Um, you know, I know when we hear a voice, there's that initial sort of, Yeah. You know, we freeze. We don't know what to do type feeling. Um, but critical thinking is, is important because you have to rule out some other things. Um, I think there's more and more education on that. And the shows are great because they can give ideas. You know, and there's a lot of articles that can say, hey, it's this or that. So if people get more information and knowledge on what to rule out, uh, I, I, there's nothing wrong with that. That's actually great. Yeah. <laughs> Um, going leaping to right away it's a ghost or to, to a, a demon or to a whatever is only going to cause you more distress. Well, that's awesome. That's a lot of information, you know, to, to and I could, I could keep going for another hour talking about all the different experiences and your thoughts. We haven't even covered, you know, near death experiences or anything like that, but we, yeah. I just want to, you know, we got to bring you back on to talk a little bit more. Get, especially when you write your book on the Hinsdale House. Yeah, awesome. well, hopefully it'll happen. Uh, it's <laughs> it's been like four years we've been writing this book. I feel like I, um, you, you know, once once you start, you you have an idea of what something is, but it never really turns out that way. Right. Uh, you know, that's in life in general as well as when you write. Uh, it never follows the outline that's in your head. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that's part of the creative process, I suppose. Uh, I don't know. I think it'd be pretty awesome when you get that done. Not if you get that done. When yeah, you thank you. Done. We'll manifest it into existence, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> we appreciate having you on. It's been great. 
Yeah, it's thanks. good seeing you again too. <laughs> yeah, thanks. It's been a it's been a great time. Any anytime you you, you want to talk more about ghosts, just let me know. Okay. We'll go ahead and let you go. Uh, all of your articles and stuff were found under haunted theories, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just go to the website Haunted Theories. Uh, Facebook is Haunted Theories. Uh, I'm not on X or Twitter too much, but I do have a Haunted Theories over there as well. But it has all the links to my research there. Uh, it's podcasts I've been on, um, just ramblings, blogs, articles, all that's right there on the website. Best way to figure out who I am. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'll see you. <laughs> have a good night. You too. Bye. And I'll go ahead and do our official outro. So thanks everyone for joining us for this episode of the podcast. We hope you were able to learn something new during this video. We will be hosting another podcast interview next Wednesday or next Sunday. Uh, so keep an eye out for our upcoming guest. Also, in the meantime, make sure to check out the Nepi Investigates YouTube series on our YouTube platform. Um, thanks everyone for joining us tonight and have a good night. Good night.